Hello friends, welcome back to channel. So today we will be having a short recall session on uh, medicine questions asked in NEET. First is a patient having bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy with bilateral uh, facial palsy and he developed blurring of vision in the right eye. So possible diagnosis. The options were uh, tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. So if you see this in sarcoidosis, this is a skating uh, kid, skating system where this system is used to classify this sarcoidosis based on the severity. First is the class one where the patient will have only bilateral hilar lymph nodes. Next is where the hilar lymph nodes will be enlarged along with infiltrates radiating from the center hilum. Next is stage 3 where the infiltrates would have reached the periphery. And is the last stage their lung is replaced by fibrous tissue, fibrosis. So actually this system is very important in uh, taking decisions regarding treatment. If you find that the patient is in stage 1, no treatment is needed. Because 50% of sarcoidosis recover spontaneously. And if the patient is in stage 2 or 3, treatment is necessary which is steroids and stage 4 no role of any steroids as it has reached the end stage it's only treatment option which can be given is lung transplant next is they have also mentioned about uh, this uveo parotid fever which is seen in sarcoidosis which is characterized by like patient will be having fever and patient will be having uh, uvia involvement in sarcoid. Sarcoidosis is nothing but granulomas everywhere. Granulomas in the iris which can form anterior uveitis. This granulomas in the uh, iris which forms those uh, nodules like cope nodules, basaka nodules, the base of the iris and mutton fat keratic precipitates all those things will be there. And if it is involves the in intermediate and posterior uh, uvea, then there will be chorioretinal lesions, the granulomas. So that might interfere with your vision. That might cause blurring of vision. Or else this KPs can itself obstruct the path of light and cause blurring of vision. And also optic disc granulomas might also form. So all these might be a contributing factor for your blurring of vision asked in the question. Next is, as we know, Granulomas can also form in the parotids causing bilateral parotid gland enlargement and also this granulomas might compress bilateral facial nerve causing bilateral facial nerve palsy. There are very few conditions causing bilateral facial nerve palsy simultaneously and sarcoidosis must be kept in the differentials among uh, if such a question is asked. So everything fits in this sarcoidosis. Next is a patient having hemifacial pain on clenching the tooth. So what is the possible uh, nerve which is involved, structure which is affected? They have marked these uh, structures and they have asked what is the probable structure which can be affected. So if you see this history, what is happening? So, unilateral facial pain which nothing gives a great clue towards trigeminal neuralgia. So why does this happen? Because the superior cerebellar artery in old females due to atherosclerosis, it becomes hardened and it compresses the trigeminal ganglion. This is the main reason for uh, this trigeminal neuralgia to happen. So what happens really? If you see in this trigeminal nerve, there is components like A alpha, A beta, A delta and C fibers. So A alpha and A beta. A beta, you know that it is responsible for carrying proprioceptive impulses like whatever movement we do, joint sense, all these are carried by these fibers. What happens is due to compression of this superior cerebral artery, these fibers are affected A alpha and A beta. So what happens is these fibers are becoming hyper excitable. So this spills off the action potentials into its neighboring neurons whenever they are compressed. So just uh, think when a beta will be stimulated to do some movement with your face. This will stimulate the proprioceptive impulses to uh, carry towards the a beta fibers. 
This action potentials will be slowly spilling into A delta fibers. A delta carries, as we know, sharp pain. So whenever we do some movement or whenever you touch the patient, tactile allodynia, movement allodynia, what happens is this A beta stimulation will fire the A delta also. This will cause sharp lancinating pain and they tell it lasts less than some very milliseconds. Because of stimulation of only A delta fibers, this sharp lancinating characteristic pain of trigeminal neuralgia happens. Now, how to find, identify what is the structure which is involved? See, in trigeminal neuralgia, most commonly affected structure will be phi 3, which is mandibular uh, section. Next is phi 2, maxillary. Next will be ophthalmic. In this uh, image, if you see, you can see the mandibular nerve straightly exiting down into the foramen ovale and two nerves which are passing the lateral wall of the uh, cavernous sinus which are nothing but maxillary and ophthalmic. So the nerve which is not at all uh, going into the cavernous sinus which is the phi 3 mandibular section will be the most commonly involved and this might be the best. Stop. Yeah. Next question, HIV treatment monitoring is done by A. Viral load P or uh, P24 antigen assay. So if you see this as per NACO 2022, the only thing which should be done routinely in this patient of HIV is viral load. Okay, even CD4 count, it's not a routine thing to do. Only viral load, it should be done at the initiation of start treatment. And after six months, you should repeat the viral load. If it is less than 50, this is the target which we need to achieve. Here, you can continue the same ART. No need to do anything. You can continue the same ART. And if it is between 50 to 1000, or if the viral load is more than 1000, here, you should repeat the test after 3 months and ensure complaints of drugs. No need to change any therapy. After this three three months of uh, treatment with complaints, if still the viral load remains more than thousand, then that means it's virological failure. It's a indication to change the regimen itself. Okay, so you can see that only with viral load we are able to take decisions regarding treatment regimen. So ob obviously, answer will be viral load. Uh, the serology is given. Hepatitis B. SAG is positive and uh, IgM for anti HBC is positive and HCV RNA is negative. So, diagnosis is first in acute HB SAG will be positive, will be initial to rise and HB DNA will be rising along with it. And also, after some time, IgM for the core antigen anti HBC will rise, okay, and it will stay even in the positive, even in the window period also. In window period, nothing will be positive except IgM anti HBC. So they are not, they are uh, asking this period, which is nothing but acute hepatitis B. Next, the mechanism of action of botulinum toxin is the mechanism of action of botulinum toxin is a. What is it doing with respect to acetylcholine in the synapse? Is it inhibiting the release? Is it inhibiting the receptors? Acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so actually what happens usually uh, as action potentials in the nerve terminal uh, happens the acetylcholine which will be loaded in the uh, terminal nerve terminals will be captured by the two proteins called synaptobrevin and syntaxin. They will coordinate this uh, vesicle and they will transfer this acetylcholine into the synapse following which acetylcholine acts on the muscle causing muscle contraction. So in this botulinum toxin, what it does is it inhibits this interaction of synaptobrevin and syntaxin with acetylcholine vesicles. So acetylcholine is not at all released. So this will lead to flaccid paralysis throughout the body. It's a cause of descending paralysis, descending flaccid paralysis. So botulinum toxin mechanism action is inhibits the release of acetylcholine into the synapse. A patient having lymphoblast in peripheral smear and he was found to have hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia and also reduced urine output and he complains of severe abdominal pain. 
so here what to do next a hydration start chemotherapy for this patient or c ultrasound whole abdomen d i think it's probenizer so here if you see what is happening this is nothing but tumor lysis syndrome which is happening lymphoblast is having the peripheral smear so actually tumor lysis syndrome is usually due to a uh, rapidly proliferating neoplasms like burkitt's lymphoma or any lymphomas or leukemias all all these things after treating this tumor cells lyse like anything and they release the intracellular contents potassium cells are bags of potassium phosphates and dna so potassium will be released causing hyperkalemia phosphate will be released causing hyperphosphatemia and dna all this nucleic acid will be released and which will be digested and converted to uric acid so hyperuricemia this phosphate what it does is it binds the ionized calcium and precipitates as calcium phosphate so ionized calcium will go low and it will cause hypocalcemia so if you see here this hyperuricemia this uric acid will starts depositing in the renal tubules and interstitium causing urate stones this will precipitate abdominal pain in such patients so here what are you going to do next step they have asked so next step if they ask always tumor lysis syndrome is a oncological emergency there is no use in diagnosing uh, with any kind of investigations immediate treatment will be hydration with lots and lots of saline okay 0.9% ns and all all occur, uh, along with allopurinol and you will be measuring uric acid and potassium sequentially so if uric acid and potassium decreases if it comes to some safe range then you can consider starting chemotherapy again okay or else you should always wait to for it stabilize if it is not at all stabilizing if uric acid is high serum potassium is high even after correction it's better start dialysis immediately hemodialysis along with raspuricase urate oxidase enzymes to decrease the uric acid levels so this should be started immediately so obviously here the initial step will be hydration next is a uh, ecg is given what is the treatment you are going to give for this patient so in this ecg if you see the heart rate as we told first is see the large box between two rr intervals it is obviously less than 3 so it is tachycardia next is to see the small boxes small boxes in a qrs complex if it is less than 3 then it is narrow qrs if it is more than 3 it is wide qrs obviously here it is more than 3 small squares qrs complex so it is wide qrs tachycardia next is you are going to see the rhythm here the rhythm if you compare to rr intervals it's regular then there are no p waves at all so it's nothing but ventricular tachycardia so here how to manage the patient first if the patient is hemodynamically unstable then you will be giving dc cardioversion then continue cpr for 3 cycles then if the patient has stabilized you can consider amiodarone there iv amiodarone or if the patient is hemodynamically stable the first drug of choice always will be iv amiodarone okay so answer to this is iv amiodarone next next this image was asked and what is the causative agent obviously the answer is warfarin warfarin causes the skin necrosis or purple toe syndrome next a uh, graph has been given and uh, temperature is marked body temperature is masked in the y axis and uh, so what happens is the points are moving from a to b to c temperature is gradually increasing they are telling happen in this sequence a shivering b uh, dilation of cutaneous capillaries or c sweating and d in which declining chemical thermogenesis so actually what what we need to do here the heat needs to be increased from a to b to c so to increase the thermostat in a body increase the body temperature what we should do body should conserve the heat as much as possible and it should produce lots of heat okay produce heat what we can do is shivering in shivering what happens is during shivering the lot of muscles are contracted and produces lots of heat okay so shivering is a good mechanism to increase heat and next mechanisms are 
cutaneous vasoconstriction so that blood flow to the skin is reduced sweat no sweating happens okay so that this heat is diverted to visceral organs next is thermogenesis should be stimulated not inhibited so obviously the answer should be shivering next an abg simply they have asked ph is low and pco2 is high bicarb is high what is the diagnosis it's nothing but ph is low so acidosis and it uh, pco2 is high carbonic acid is high so respiratory acidosis next next a patient of acute rheumatic fever and a patient doesn't have any evidence of any carditis no carditis so what is the secondary prophylaxis you can give for this patient a 5 years since the last attack or up to 18 years of age or 10 years of 10 years since the last last attack or till 20 years of age lifelong so here what they are asking secondary prophylaxis so the list is uh, when the patient have acute rheumatic fever with no carditis then you should just give for 5 years since the last attack or 18 years of age whichever is longer and if it is having a mild carditis or healed carditis there you should be giving for 10 years since the last attack or 25 years whichever is longer next is if the patient has severe carditis here you will be giving 40 years of 40 years since the last attack or lifelong whichever is longer and the last thing valve surgery after valve surgery also it's possible in the remaining valves so lifelong prophylaxis should be given even after valve replacement okay yes thanks for watching we'll be meeting you soon in a next recall session thank you